I'm very excited to be here uh, today to talk with uh, people who have my same interest. Usually you go to interdisciplinary um, conferences, but on different topics, and I bring the dialogue in. And here are um, people who are all bringing dialogue in, so I'm very, very, very glad about that. So thank you very much. Um, my presentation, the title, Dialogic Dialogues and Analysis of Online Interactions Transforming Strangers into a Community. The goal I have today, and I think it's like the goal we have all today, is having a discussion on dialogue and trying to understand that, proposing that as a key paradigm to foster an inclusive transformation of society. So the method I use um, to bring out my results in, or my ideas in, is conversational analysis and intercultural hermeneutics. The corpus I was analyzing, and I'm analyzing because I've just uh, started, let's say, in relation to the, the wideness of the, of the corpus, uh, it's um, our interactions of two international simulation games. I have to say something, I had, there was a misunderstanding, I understood workshop uh, as a workshop, as in German usually uh, is used the term, so um, kind of one hour working together and discussing about certain stuff, so I was I wanted to show you videos and transcripts, but as uh, then I understood that there are 15 minutes, I will just show you uh, the results, uh, at least the results I have by now. And I'm very excited about discussing them with you. The theoretical reflections uh, I want to in introduce um, now is are very, very fundamental and very maybe easy for you. Anyways, uh, what I'm, where I'm starting from is the idea of the building an inclusive society means fostering and spreading a culture of dialogue. What is a culture of dialogue? Dialogue, as I understand that, and I heard that as many of you does, uh, do understand that in the same way, is a, um, the core of dialogue is participation. Without participation, there is no dialogue. I can, I can have a dialogue with myself, but I have to participate too, as two different reasons, for example, two different parts of myself. So in a dialogue, an interpersonal dialogue, you need uh, participation. And this participation is uh, oriented to discover the difference of the other. There is the real core of dialogue is getting, uh, getting um, enriched uh, yourself and getting to know other perspectives, the other person. Um, and when do people really participate? when they feel they can participate. So the opportunity to participate must be there. And obviously, as equal are the participants of this dialogue, uh, more easier or easier it is uh, to really uh, express your difference. So we see the culture of dialogue is really something working against exclusion. Mm -hmm because participation, if you participate, if you manage in a dialogue culture, and dialogic, through, thanks to the dialogic culture to participate, then you are not excluded. Um, and how is happening exclusion? Exclusion is happening every day through discrimination. Discrimination, how does it realize on three levels, individual level, institutional level, and structural level? And thinking about that, we could say that culture of dialogue also develop on these uh, dimensions. What is very interesting, important to me uh, in general and in specific today is the individual level. Because um, also in the institutional level, all, all, all laws, for example, are made by people. And all laws are also implemented by people. So like the individual level is, I think, the most important. Um, because the culture of dialogue is performed and spread through it. Yeah, so I express my dialogic attitude uh, and expressing them, leaving them, performing them, then I spread it. So in this sense, it's also a culture. Yeah, and that be can become normality. And through that, then you come to the transformation of society. So it's really important to foster dialogic interactions um, so in the in the title, I spoke about dialogic dialogues because I was thinking to show you some certain dialogues. Here I speak of dialogic interactions because uh, interaction are not just like um, interpersonal uh, spoken dialogues, but can uh, happen in different ways. And the characteristic of dialogic interactions is one side participation, uh, all people are engaged into it. Um, 
And participation is also connected very tightly with feeling of being part. Now, in the moment I participate, I feel part, but I also have to feel part to participate. So the research question I'm going through uh, in this presentation and in my research work at the moment is what fosters and what hinders the development of dialogic interactions. And that's the title of my presentation, how do strangers become community? How through this dialogue interaction, strangers manage to get together and feel part of a group. I started dealing with this question, uh, actually theoretically many years ago, but in very concretely focusing on um, communication in 2016 with a European action research project named Charmed uh, or Charmed. Um, and they rethinking teaching in order to foster inclusion. So the question was, how can teacher really create a dialogic atmosphere so that uh, children not, are not just uh, lived and experienced as a black box, which have to learn the things that the, the expert know, but can really participate actively to this learning process and can construct it, can, can co-build in it. Um, some uh, key results which are relevant for our presentation today is uh, in order to facilitate dialogic interaction, a dialogic attitude, so what was described also before, openness and curiosity is not enough. You really need also facilitative techniques um, and self-reflection. Yeah, that was uh, the perspective of the teacher, even the ones were more open to the other, um, really weren't able to support uh, dialogic uh, dialogues or dialogic interactions in general. So what we did in this project is really trying to understand what are these uh, facilitative techniques, communicative techniques, which fosters participation. And self-reflection is then absolutely very important, as uh, Rafael said. Now, though, the, the results I'm presenting come out of my new project, um, researching digital interculturality cooperatively and in this big project there is a small one uh, which i'm working now uh, on it and um, is uh, the goal is studying the dialogic interaction among peers it's about uh, observing students uh, playing together uh, which didn't know it who didn't know each other before but have to play together and reach a certain goal and these games are uh, simulation games are oriented to collaboration the games are two mega cities and Bilangon, and I think it's quite interesting because you, they have really they have um, to create a city together in one game or uh, create a concept for an island together so that they can uh, receive it as a present. Uh, so they are different cities or they have different parts of the islands and they had to come together. So really creating community. So on the meta level of the game. And what I do is observing uh, the interaction and they really manage also in the real game to get community, become a community. So some results, um, interesting is to notice that a common learning outcome for the students is, wow, collaborations fosters enrichment. Uh, many says that was maybe new. I know, I know that working with the other is, is enriching, but I really have experienced that uh, again. So uh, a, a student said, it happened a few times that I thought I have a great idea, but then someone else spoke and they had a better one. Um, so uh, that happens that it was a frequent um, um, outcome, let's say. And I think it's interesting to observe as collaboration. Here we have two central points of dialogue. One is participation, yeah, collaboration implies participation. And the other one is this idea of enrichment. And enrichment you have it just because the other ones are not you yourself, otherwise they will have all this first great idea. Um, but it's something um, is missing here. Um, and that is equal opportunity. And that is uh, really something I could observe in different situation. Uh, it's lack of equal opportunity inside the group, bigger groups, smaller groups. Um, it's lack hindered participation and feeling of being part, which we said are very connected to each other. So um, the development of dialogic interactions is not so easy, it's challenging. Yeah? Uh, Rafael was saying because I have to be open to go into it, 
yeah uh, but uh, not just because of that uh, that it was our um our project obliged the students to get part of it because they decided to be part of it uh, inscribe it to the course um but let's see what happened then so uh, we observed that not all strangers transform into a community some strangers have been excluded i'm speaking about strangers now in the sense that everyone was a stranger to the other so some strangers have been excluded and left the game. Uh, that was, wasn't very frequent, but it happened. Um, and observing these processes, and this is an, obviously an extreme process, no? but, and there were also other processes where people were still in the game, um, but not really giving the feeling to feel comfortable, even if in general it was um, working quite well. So, at least from the interaction, the observation we have made by now. So um, why is it like this? Why did this, for example, strangers who went out of the, of the game didn't become part of the community as the other strangers uh, succeeded in? Um, so the factors uh, which uh, makes more difficult, uh, also the, key, the, key, the key reason is, has to do with power, or at least one key reason I could observe. So the factors which makes more difficult to feel that I have the power to speak and to use the power that I have. Uh, and if I don't feel like getting it, uh, using it, um, then someone else maybe can get, give me this power. So to get this power, it depends on factors like gender. We observe very much uh, differences there. So for males were quite e more easy to take the power than uh, that means to participate, to get into it. Uh, then for the others, personality, obviously, language proficiency, that was uh, particularly interesting, it was also an international game, um, and then peculiar skills, peculiar skills which make you maybe give um, more participating because you can do something that the others cannot and it's useful for everyone. There are obviously very many other factors, these are the ones we have seen, and obviously in the background is uh, the concept of intersectionality which uh, done, doesn't reflect in this interaction because I don't have so much information about the people, but uh, anyways, are certainly uh, playing a big role. Um, so um, different distribution of power. We have seen not all in this, all of these strangers had the same power and that carries with it at risk of exclusion. So that uh, very important uh, is, at least uh, from my uh, observations, willingness of sharing power, the one who speak, the one who take decision, uh, the one who, who, who it's easy for them yeah, to do it, then it's very important that they are willing to share this, this power. Um, then obviously I noticed that many times it wasn't that they weren't willing, the need wasn't even conscious that they were taking so much space and they weren't giving uh, to other people space and that the others weren't able to take them, to take it themselves. So the consciousness about unequal power distribution. Then a uh, central point is caring about the others. Uh, we had situation where people were just ignored as these two strangers uh, who went away. They were completely ignored. Uh, it's a, it was fine that they don't say anything and they don't say anything. They don't say anything. Nobody were asking them, hey, what do you think? They were completely ignored. That was a key, a key problem, I think, but I come to it. And the facility skills. So uh, as we said, as I saw in the other project, um, it's uh, not enough to be, to want uh, to, to, how do you say, to, to be willing to, to share power, to have really participations with the other, but it's also important to know how to do it. How can you communicate so that the people feel comfortable, feel invited to join you in this communication? Uh, feeling seen, uh, heard, accepted, and appreciated uh, strength, strengthens uh, trust, which is a condition for participation. Yeah? And feeling comfortable in the group increases participation and feeling of being part. So uh, concluding, we can say that the characteristics of dialogues are the ones needed actually to foster the development of inclusive uh, communities. A dialogic culture is nourished by relationships of trust, which imply the willingness and the ability of sharing power for the ones who have it, and the possibility of taking power for the other one. Thank you. So, uh, last sentence, so strangers become a community if they are able not 
to ignore each other, but to really care about and for each other. So thank you very much. So our presentation will be slightly different in the sense that we are not a classical research project, but um, a project which also has a very strong practical angle and we'll just share some first so we started about six to eight months ago and we just want to share some reflections on how we work and the methodology and how dialogue plays a role in it and it's meant to be kind of a self-reflective exercise where we see dialogue as a vehicle to um, sort of yeah, reaching our aim. So I will give you first a little bit of background on the project and then Julia will move into the specifics. So um, we're working in the so-called Franco-German Forum for the Future and it's a project for now which has been mandated by the German and French governments. So on a very high, it was like initiated by Merkel and Macron. Uh, that's where the mandate comes. And um, the idea is that we generate a forum and dialogue on societal transformations, uh, which include like very broad topics like climate change, social inequalities, uh, structural economic changes, etc. And as uh, our director phrased it once very nicely, we basically try to address the problems of tomorrow with a means of, yet yeah, or what we try to change is that so far a lot has been tried um, that we address the challenges of tomorrow with a means of yesterday, and we try to find new innovative solutions look for them, harness them, but basically by focusing on local initiatives on the ground and what we can learn from them. So uh, the project came about by a realization that a lot of classic bureaucracy uh, on national level, but also local levels works very much in silos. And uh, there is a very limited sort of, or sometimes, innovations are kind of slow and they're not always local knowledge from people on the ground working on the problems concretely is not always taken into account in the decision making process. This includes uh, actors like non governmental actors like civil society, um, but also economic actors. So how we work is that the project seeks to build on um, experiences in both countries, France and Germany, uh, on different topics. Right now we work, for instance, on local climate change and to kind of, as I said, see what works or not on the ground and potentially um, see if there are patterns across different initiatives uh, who work on similar issues and if there we can draw some lessons for the national level. Julia, I hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Nora, and thanks um, for being here. Um, yeah, uh, I'm just going to, in the next two slides, quickly uh, present our approach to research and we see ourselves as a project with a transformative research agenda, which means that uh, we try to identify conditions, barriers and drivers for equitable transformations towards sustainability in local and regional communities in France and Germany. We seek to inspire practitioners of transformation at local and regional levels through dialogue. Uh, and engage them actively in the research process. And here I would uh, probably refer what, what Louisa referred to as dialogic interactions. Uh, and uh, we also seek to develop recommendations with and for policymakers at national level to provide uh, conducive framework conditions for local and regional communities. So what we really try to do is, um, oh, I'll come to that just now. We really try to gather the experience bring up the knowledge to the political level and, and have people also dialogue amongst themselves at that level. So um, the, the, our tenets of research is really one of transdisciplinarity, meaning that we uh, as researchers engage with actors from politics, civil society and the private sector across the entire research project. This also means that we are an, a very interdisciplinary team, meaning that we are not all researchers. 
Um, then we have the tenet of co-creativity, uh, meaning that we study the implementation of multi-stakeholder processes resulting in reciprocal learning and decision-making. And we uh, don't see scientists um, as the sole nodes of knowledge production. Um, rather, um, we see the co-creative transformative we see that co-creative transformative knowledge emerges through the interaction and dialogue of a variety of actors. And that is also why our main form of research is collaborative action research, um, where we partner with local initiatives. And finally, and this I've just mentioned before, is that we see ourselves very much as bottom up, um, i.e. that we work from a locally embedded perspective and uh, we study and feed this perspective upwards. And in this sense, there's also a dialogic element uh, between the bottom and the top. And here is this, uh, uh, at the moment, still not yet very beautiful <laughs> slide um, of our, um, how can I say, of our structure as a as project, uh, which is that we, we have these three components. Um, and if we start at the bottom, we, we, we have peer dialogues, and these are like actual curated peer dialogues. And uh, the objective of these peer dialogues is that we foster learning and inspiration at local and regional level through mutual exchange and reflection between municipalities and in France and Germany on, on specific topics. Um, those are these these curated dialogues are you know on the one hand a means to give back to communities we engage with as researchers but they're also crucial in terms of detecting patterns challenges and opportunities transversally across sites in France and Germany and also the framework conditions in which these municipalities work uh, and we we use these dialogues also uh, um, you know, in terms of engaging participants as co-creators. And again, these, these kind of curated peer dialogues, you know, stand in relation to our collaborative action research, where we have field researchers in specific sites. Uh, at the moment in Germany, it's Marburg and the so-called Burgenlandkreis, that's an area in uh, Sachsen-Anhalt, uh, which is Saxony, not Saxony, but I don't know how to, the English translation, but um, in the former uh, Eastern Germany. Um, and we also um, work with our partners in France in the communities of Los Anguel, and La Rochelle and Moissartou, uh, which is in the south of Germany, whereas Los Anguel and Dunkerque is in the Haut de France. And, uh, and here we try to generate uh, with, you know, with our collaborative action research with those communities, we, we try to generate co-creative new knowledge on how local and regional communities are affected by societal transformations and structural factors that hinder or promote sustainable and equitable social transformation at local and regional level. And, and here comes the dialogic, and then we kind of try to trigger and facilitate reflection through our action research and also learning and testing new ways of doing things. That's where the action part comes in. And as I said before this, we try to then um, lift up uh, onto a kind of higher political national level, both in France and Germany, where we engage people in so-called resonance spaces which means that we gather people to discuss our findings and develop recommendations. And now I hand over to back to Nora to talk about a very specific example. of our Exactly. So to make it all a bit more tangible, we wanted to give you some first insights into how we work and what we could see as potential, let's call it impact of our work, uh, which very much very much uses the tool of dialogue. So as uh, Julia briefly mentioned, in Germany, we work with the city of Marburg. It's in the west of Germany, a small university town, um, which has committed to becoming uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and is actively working on it right now in the collaborative format. So they have a, collect, um, a local climate action plan where they define measures of how to reach um, carbon neutrality. And uh, their approach and vision is to implement that plan together with civil society and all other actors concerned 
so also citizens, um, economic actors, etc. And um, our role is sort of to be there, observe and accompany that process, learn from them, but also support them in their work while they're trying to implement this plan. So what we did was first uh, being exposed to the field, talking um, in our action research approach to various actors. So basically at the proper sense of the word, entering into dialogue with them and trying to understand the different positions, how they see the progress of the plan's implementation, um, and notice that even though there is a big commitment to this uh, plan and this overall goal, uh, there are very different understandings of how it should be done and how they feel this collaborative effort between civil society and um, local government is going. So uh, methodological speaking, dialogue in one way came in by different uh, formats of exchange, classical research interviews, but also um, regular meetings with representatives from the city in like so-called geofix or working meetings where we regularly fed in some of our observations and tried to offer reflections on what we see. The second part is what we just talked about more on an abstract level is that we have a series of very curated dialogues of a dedicated team within our project who try to bring different local actors together and try to get them to think together. So what we organized was um, there is another city in Germany which is very active in this uh, promoting climate change locally and also developed a similar plan so that they enter into a dialogue. It was a session of uh, twice an hour and a half to two hours where they basically compared the experiences of what works well so far and what not. And we could see that through that exchange, they sort of will come to that in a minute, but they basically um, it triggered new reflections of how to do it in their locality. And then also after uh, our first few months of action research, we noticed that part of why um, the implementation of this plan is very tricky at the moment comes to a structural problem of where, um, who is responsible for steering this implementation process, so the governance structure. And therefore we put um, them into dialogue with one of our French initiatives, which has a very um, collaborative model of engaging economic actors, civil society into uh, a similar venture of getting uh, carbon neutral. It uh, works there quite successfully so that again, they would enter into conversation and learn from each other. Yes. and. Um... Noah already gave some first reactions to those uh, workshops and engagements, and I think what, what is specific in my book is, is that there's so much energy and so much will to, to change and, 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 and to walk this path towards climate neutrality, but at the same time, there's really the devil in the detail in terms of civil society often feeling excluded, um, administration not really knowing how to open up themselves, etc. So these dialogues really helped the, the reflection process on why is that the case and, and they saw just by talking to, to another municipality that basically goes through a similar process, they, they managed to get this mirror perspective and managed to kind of you know, move out of their silo, so to speak, and, and, and really see also the other side in terms of the other side as in the administrative side, so the civil society side, and not only in their own place, but also in another place. And so they did realize that it was mainly structural issues rather than personal issues that led to conflict so far. And, and they were very inspired by these dialogues to reflect on their, their, their relations uh, in their town and uh, agreed now uh, to, uh, well, before I come to the next point, they are actually interested in developing with us now a new governance structure, uh, which means a governance structure that really involves uh, 
many different actors in the city uh, in order to, to really join forces uh, in, a, in a more innovative way, um, kind of overcoming the, the classical boundaries between administration and civil society uh, in order to reach their, their goal. And, and um, another kind of side outcome of the dialogue was that the Marburg officials agreed with the city of Constance officials on further dialogues, meaning they were kind of inspired by the dialogue and they want, want more. And now our role is over, we kind of can step back and, and, and they just continue with their dialogues. Our work uh, is from a background of understanding the dynamics of policing crowd events. We're particularly interested in how crowd events are managed by powerful actors such as the police and the centrality of dialogue in the effective management of crowd dynamics in ways that enable the police to de-escalate tension and conflict while at the same time uh, function to maximise the expression of consciousness and freedom of assembly. So there's a, an issue at work here in how we understand the role of dialogue in public order policing and crowd management. And what we've been studying uh, most recently is the management of public assemblies in the pandemic. And in particular, uh, we've been focused on um, the issue of uh, how the police in London approach the management of a public assembly that grew up in the wake of a murder of uh, a young woman uh, called Sarah Everard, who was making her way home um, when she was kidnapped uh, raped and then murdered by a serving police officer. And in the wake of that, a vigil uh, developed that was uh, constructed and seen as illegal uh, by the Metropolitan Police Service. And we've been exploring the dynamics of that and uh, in particular issues around leadership and uh, dialogue and the role of dialogue or indeed the failure of the role of dialogue um, in our analysis of the event. So uh, it looks to me like, Terry, you've managed to resolve the issue. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stoff, for uh, his very quick opening that set the context for this presentation. So the presentation this time, we uh, kind of um, make the heading as thank you for coming. A very interesting phrase that pop up a lot of time during speeches that being delivered in the vigil, kind of showing that they are being the leader of the events. That's why we're kind of interested in, in the context of COVID-19 regulation, the vigil have been ruled as uh, kind of illegal and being banned to be uh, going ahead. But at the end of the day, the crowd gather in, in the bandstand in uh, Chapel Common in London, and also several kind of candidates of leader go on to the bandstand and deliver, deliver some speeches. So we're interested in how um, this kind of contingent leadership emerged in the crowd and what kind of dialogical relationship that in play that, that helped the leadership emerge. So why we are interested in this particular case, not only because this is a kind of interesting policing case within the UK, it also matched the kind of um, overall kind of tendency of social movement within the world, which is we see a lot of leaderless protests that emerge around the world as a new trend of social movement. So it's also coming in the context of the, the kind of ideological polarizing within the world that, for example, in the US, we got the Black Lives Matter and also the Capitol riot. Seems that we do not have a kind of good capacity to engage with different community within the society. And that new community that emerging in the society organized in a very different way that um, some of the older generation of social movement cannot understand how it works. So we, under, we try to use as a case study to look at this very interesting phenomenon because we exactly have a case that because of the COVID-19 regulation, that particular protest or we can call it a ritual or gathering being rendered uh, leaderless 
it don't have a leader from the beginning. So you have a leader vacuum to start with. So to understand leader, leaderless protest, I think we, we also need to go back to the idea of leadership. And to explore the idea of leadership, we need also need to go back to the kind of more classical theorization of leadership, which is like a great man. Um, I, I keep the keep the use of man be, not because of the gender insensitivity, but because that is the historical context of leadership that leader is kind of associated with uh, masculinity and and manhood. That this kind some kind of charisma of great leader is being seen as the kind of the sense of leadership, and also what how people study leadership is usually find the leader the kind of great leader in the world like uh, Martin Luther King Gandhi and and or the more extreme sample Hitler how they are able to use the charisma to kind of recruit follower and have people follow his kind of agenda his cult or personality so what is assumed in this kind of leadership relationship is a leader followers relationship. So in a sense that the leader is the creator of the culture and followers are more in a passive role, a kind of cultural dog of adapting some of the culture. And also the other assumption of leadership is the leadership is kind of attached to the agents which have some kind of personal quality that enable him to have a, a one-way power relationship over his or her follower. So the followers kind of adopt the culture that le the leader produced and kind of follow suit. But what we see in uh, the more recent social movement is this kind of classical leadership is in decline. I think partly it could be uh, attributed to the dissatisfaction toward classical leadership. Not only the historical reason that we have for, of the kind of associate with this kind of charisma with authoritarian leaders like Hitler, Mussolini, but also the uh, the satisfaction that this kind of classical centralized leadership failed to deliver social change. We kind of see that in, um, in environmental agenda from more centralized organization. Now we have in UK extension rebellion that also kind of have this kind of decentralized organization of doing the social movement. And I think the second element that contributes to the, this trend is also the social media, the social mediatization of leadership or the social identity that the crowd from minus dot now have the capacity, have also the bandwidth to be both the adopters and also the creators. We post on social media what we do. And in the social movement uh, nowadays, like environmentalists, they also post on Twitter what they kind of try to present as a social uh, as a social identity. For example, environmentalists, what we saw in uh, G7 protests in the last weekend is a lot of protesters kind of exploit the, the, uh, the kind of sea sign to do all kind of demonstration to show their, their kind of position toward the G7 leaders. And I think the third element that we must consider is also the existing legal framework that the crowd policing is kind of designed around that kind of classical model of leadership, which is we find the organizer, we sanction the organizer, and that's the way the state mainly used to stop protest. What we see in the Sarah Afrarash vigil is the Metropolitan Police basically told the organizer of the vigil that if you go ahead with organizing the protest, you will be fined like 10,000 of pounds, which is a, a big sum for every individual who organized the, the, the events. So, I think the decentralized uh, movement is also a way to evade the legal framework that the, the kind of uh, ongo uh, the police use to police crowd. And what we see emerging is uh, the, uh, the individualization of the identity perf performance 
not only they are detached from a particular leader and also it become symbolized the participation become very symbolized when we see for example the protests in in chile in hong kong in myanmar we now don't have like a, a kind of specific um, agent that walk in front of the crowd, but rather we have a lot of symbols like the mask, hand gesture that represent that identity. And also, of course, the, one of the form is leaderness, the decentralized organization of how to organize protests. So the research question we have uh, to put in a nutshell is, what is the kind of this kind of new grammar uh, in a Wiccan science then that uh, anthropological sense of grammar, how this kind of new inter, inter and intra-group dynamic work in protest. So in a sense that now we say, we kind of understand that the, the protest is now decentralized, but in a sense still, you have a large crowd who organize themselves together to do the same thing. So how power and, and in-group dynamic work in protest. This is the first one we're interested in. And the second one is we're interested in whether we can learn something about leadership within leaderless protest. And to give you some background about the, uh, the vigil that, that uh, Cliff already started on is um, on, on this year in March, Third, we have uh, a, a lady, uh, Sarah Afarash, missing in her neighborhood. And then later in, in the early of the month, there is an unfolding situation that uh, Metropolitan Police is being charged and then late, uh, being arrested, and then he is charged with murder. And it, where, while that event is unfolding on 10th of March, a uh, local group called Reclaim This Street announced that they, were, they are going to organize a vigil, not specifically for, for Sarah at that time, for all the women being the victim of uh, violence on the street, to organize such a vigil in Chapel Common where Sarah is reported to be missing. So what is unfolded is because of the uh, COVID-19 regulation at the end, uh, Metropolitan Police announced that they will not support such a vigil being banned and also warn again any participation of any gathering around Chapel Common on 13th. And we also have the organizer who come on to television and also issue a this statement that they are going to cancel the event and, and suggest that they should hold an online vigil, everyone stay at home and hold a candle. But also that the kind of pressure called uh, converge because you have uh, on 12th of March, you have a court ruling that um, the, the the, um, the court refused to intervene with the police decision, but at the same time, the officer being arrested is being charged with murder on 12. So you have a kind of pressure building up just before the scheduled time of the vigil. So eventually the crowd appear around the bandstand in, in the earlier days, start to uh, pay tribute to Sarah Afrash by putting flower in front of the bandstand where the original vigil uh, planned to take place. And, and adding to that, I think is you have also national television who go onto the ground to broadcast that event. So what, end up near six o'clock is you have a you have a crowd that gather around the bandstand of Chapel Common. This is the where the bandstand is. It's like at the middle of a very large uh, park greenland. And then the crowd start to gather around that bandstand. And you also have media gathering on the bandstand to televise and also post it on social media what happened in Chapel Common. So you have kind of two stage of the uh, of the crowd. And because of the time, I'm just going to show you the kind of final speeches. There are three speeches being delivered in, uh, in the events. The first one is by uh, middle-aged 
uh, male who is having a kind of anti-lockdown position. The second one is the local councillor who also lead a minute of silence to, uh, to pay the tribute to Sarah. And this is the third one uh, in the row. Right. So I cannot show the video in that mode. But uh, at, at the end, a group of young activists go on the stage and also deliver a speech kind of anti-police and also pro-protection of women, the right to be on the street, to go on the stage and deliver that speech. And also they deliver in a very engaging style that they ask the crowd to repeat what they said. So it's not kind of the old style of a top-down approach of delivery speech that you listen to me. It's an engaging approach, dialogical approach that emerge in the crowd and also facilitate the display of the identity of the crowd as, a, as in support of women on the street. So what we got is not only um, free speeches that have their own dialogical relationship, because in the first speech that I cannot show you because of the limit of the time is in the first speech, when the middle-aged male go on the stage, soon when he his agenda of anti-lockdown agenda become explicit, he was rejected by the crowd. And then in the second speech, when the councillor go on the stage saying that I am the local councillor, I'm on behalf of the local community, she is kind of accepted as a legitimate speaker or leader to the crowd who lead the minute of silence and also ask the crowd to start to disperse. So she is also approved as a legitimate leader in the crowd. And the third one that, that kind of piqued the dynamic is you have very energetic, engaging, a uh, speaker who go on to stage with identity of being a young female and also they announce that this, the main speaker is a, a victim of um, domestic violence, that she claimed the, the legitimacy to speak on the stage. And by having that free role of dynamic un underneath that free dialogue, you also have a longer dialogue that you have a community of practice that emerge uh, underneath, which is the Christ being trained and being trust each other that they will act in the same way. They will reject the same illegitimate category and they will accept the same uh, legitimate category, which is female and also young female victim uh, in, in, in light of their own, own agenda. No problem, no problem. So I think I think uh, what we I want to encapsulate in that um, that dialogue process is leadership is no longer just a creator of culture. In a sense, in the social media kind of age, they are also the facilitator of the expression of social identity. So they're not just the creator of it, but they facilitate the crowd to do that in front of the camera to show solidarity. So there is a very different or in, in a sense, more democratic kind of dynamic of leadership and power in this kind of new uh, mode of social movement. 